I mean, so you've we, always been a strong pro-freedom party. Yeah, we've always um, felt that's one of those central tenets to um, yeah. where we are. But the fate of sitting members depends on electors in the cities and those who come many miles and buy varied forms of transport to vote in outlying booths in country towns. Still in New South Wales, they can quench their thirst as hotels are open for the first time on election day. Tell me uh, about Catter's Australia Party and with the galaxy of right-wing minor parties to vote from in the upcoming federal election, what makes Catter's Party different from all the other ones out there that think they've got something that nobody else does? What, what is the unique selling proposition? Oh, well, I think if you tried to boil it down to its primary structure, comparing to other parties, it's the values and principles, and that, that sounds a bit um, waffly or just sloganish, but I'd, I would argue um, the, the, the genesis of our party was that the National Party had moved too close to the Liberals and, you know, and issues like, say, economic rationalism and, and um, where you had um, um, some of those valued protections like quota systems in the dairy industry, it was deregulation of the dairy, has decimated the dairy industry and still has, and it's been reduced almost nothing. 2,000 farms, like 400. Um, tobacco industry. Um, and not that, um, you know, Dad said he started politics as a trade liberal, but it was just, there was evidence that it was doing more damage than good in, in um, some of those primary producing areas. And, uh, and the gap that was um, always solidly filled by the nationals in that space was being vacated and there was a vacuum occurring. And um, so the challenge was how do we move things politically and, and shift some of that policy back into that vacuum created that the Nationals were left. And it was either to try and go back into the party system and work within that structure framework of the LNP um, to work as an independent or to form a party to try and um, take up that space and hold that, be that counterpoint yep. um, in Parliament. And that's the option we went with. And, so it's, the party doesn't exist, as I'd argue some others do, for the purpose of itself. It exists to follow these values and principles. So without those, we don't exist. We don't exist to, um, to uh, perpetuate a, a branding or a name, um, yeah. which I'd argue some, I think, do. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a novel concept. <laughs> it's the other, complete other way around. If yeah. someone adopted our values and principles, I'd go and go back to being a property value again and... <laughs> Right. Packing my tools, I've, yep. and um, and I like I pride myself personally, um, and I guess it's relevant being the leader of the party with four members is in p members of parliament is that I like I'm a reluctant politician. Like I don't, I don't want to be here. I was in a position where I could move, and I think you know it's life's about your um, vocations and you know following those answering the call where it's needed. And um, I'm here doing a job where I can to promote those principles. Yeah. And so, you know, whenever you talk to anyone about mergers or, you know, coming together as a party, and which we have before, I said, well, what's your values and principles? Because, well, buddy, we can exit the battlefield if you're doing the job, you know, yeah. and it's very, very difficult to pin them down to yeah. non-negotiable, this is things that we stand for. Mm. I mean, sure, there's issues that other parties are strong on at the time, but yeah. four, three or four years' time, where are they at? Because compare yourself to the National Party, what are the principles that CADA stands for, the CADA Party, yeah. that the Nationals have betrayed or, or compromised, in I your think, opinion? Yeah, okay, well, um, I, I think they sort of snooking themselves, and many, well, I think, would admit that it was a mistake trying to marry the brand, because you can go to towns in my electorate, like here on Richmond, Dewey Creek, and say, well, look, I'm not part of that Liberal Party that represents interest down south in Brisbane, I'm part of the National Party, and um, and you can still connect with the old shearers or the railway workers, or the well, they'll still accept that you're part of that, which was almost the old country labour yeah. principles, you know. That um, no, we want coal mining out here, you know, and now there is a job for railway workers here. That's that's important that we've got maintain some of these things, and it is important for government to build infrastructure where there's gaps in private investment and um, and and owning strategic assets like the. And the trunk infrastructure like your power lines and your poles that's you know mm. they're sort of principles you can hit on but when you try and marry that up with the liberals they're saying well no 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 that's not what we're doing and um and uh um 
so that you try and win, you go now and try and win those seats. And that's why the LNP just having so much trouble in the regional areas because the national brand used to still capture enough of that old country Labor vote to make them competitive with Labor. And, but Labor just out competing consistently because that, and, and I'd like to think we've, you know, well, if, you know, our individual results in seats is pretty, I'd say, outstanding. <laughs> Um, my seat, Nick Demetto Shane's, um, we can pretty competently manage and hold those seats strongly and achieve those, take those hard lines. So let's go through a quick, you know, cross section of issues like the reef. Um, we've got reef regulations come back into Parliament this week where our proposition is um, the same as what Peter Ridd said and the same as the last AIMS report that said record coral cover growth. Yeah. Excuse me, record coral cover growth. But I've been listening to the media for the last ten years telling me it's dying. Yeah, that's an AIMS report. And AIMS are no friend of my sort of pot. You know, usually I, I'm disagreeing with all the things they're saying, but their report, their 2021 I'm report. I'm just guessing. I'm not familiar with AIMS, but does it Australian, stand for Australian Institute of Marine Science? That would have been my guess. There is no one. Yeah. There is no one more above them in the hierarchy of expertise on the Great Barrier Reef in the world. They're lefties. <laughs> they're environmental hardcore. I would say that, you know, I would pigeonhole, that's how you would characterise, but their own report um, is record coral cover growth, yet we've got legislation in there to repeal the reef reg laws, which are all predicated on saving the reef, mm. even though 99% of particulate matter scientifically is demonstrated not to even make it out to the reef from these rivers, mm. but we're punishing the farmers and telling them to cut back on their fertiliser, which will make... Um, and it's quite easy to demonstrate this, will make farming as we know it, the sugarcane industry, unviable to the point where there's not enough production or go below yeah. the critical components of the mills. Mills become less, will shut down. So move on from the reef. What are some other So policies? I'm sorry, that so the reef, but you'll have the LNP will be voting with Labor on the reef. You to, joke. So they'll be taking the side of... Environmental Latte extremists. Super, environmental extremists to win votes here. Really? because it's about winning, there's no values or principles yep. there, it's about winning government. To win government, you've got to start taking votes off the greenies in the city, and, yep. and it's all this competition in the southeast corner of these issues. Right, so yep. we can just pick it up, pick up a fire on the issue. So you have greenies in West End dictating Liberal Party policy uh, to try and compete with the Labor You have the government. LNP for 12, 18 months dining out on Category H firearms, which is pistols for farmers. It was an issue that they were clearly allowed in the party to talk about and we put the motion in before that election saying, well, okay, make it as of right for a primary producer to get access to vote it against it. <laughs> and it's, it's, I mean, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. You can tell. And it, it's not doing it, tear the LNP down, but it's just say what you are. So tell me about the areas um, Cata Party is a better option than One Nation in regional Australia. Well, um, you know, I don't, I don't like putting any on other parties down or anything. I, where I think our strengths are is that um, it's it's easier. I shouldn't use the word easier, but I would much prefer to be a senator where I don't have a constituency um, based. You know, to have constituents asking you to fix the crossing on the road or get more teachers in the school and lobby for sports fields in Cloncurry and um, fix this and that, which mm. is just eighty percent of your time is burnt up. In the Senate, I talk about policy, and I get to, and I've got my my constituency is Queensland, so I can just sit in front of the. But what about the day. federal candidates in this coming? Yeah, election? so same thing again. If, if I could sit in the, the lower house, uh, if I can sit in the federal parliament, I could sit at, you know, on policy level and just debate, and that I'd love that. But you've got to be a doer, and where we can outcompete, if you're, we've only got lower house seats in the KP, only ever have. Right. And that's about winning 30 to 40% of the primary vote. Mm. Um, most of us are winning 50%. So you don't have now. Senate candidates? We do, right. but we've never seriously competed in that. But, oh, I shouldn't say that. We've just, we've never been successful in the, in the upper house. Never been a contender. Yeah, because I think the formula... Interesting. And that's probably because... Uh, well, it's 14% versus 40%. Right. 14% yeah. of the state, you can pick a, an issue that's a big, hot topic... Um, and be a single issue or maybe, you know, two major issues that you're well identified, Darren Hinch. So because of your regional access and because of the urbanisation of most of the population, you can dominate a regional electorate, but it's a lot harder to dominate the state, including the metropolitan areas. Yeah, yeah, precisely. That, that makes sense. Yeah. Do you guys have federal candidates outside of Queensland? 
Uh, we we have in the past. Um, this federal election? No, not this federal election. No, no. We've taken the view the last couple of elections is let's just do what we do well. Yep. And oh, see what happens from there. Do you think there are any right wing minor parties at the moment, or parties which are considered conservative or country or right of centre, which are probably uh, given a bit too much credit? Um, a party that's not as friendly to farmers and regional jobs as as um, they might be perceived to be or they might like to think they are? Well, yeah, I mean, I've got loads of evidence than the two majors, but in which we're, we're excluding the two majors. Yeah. But... I don't even know anyone that's sort of um, purporting to represent that area that strongly other than us of focusing that area. Is the United um, Australia Party going to have much of a showing? Oh, I'm sure they north would. Of like, um, well, that's an interesting question. I think, I think uh, the United Australia Party, um, their vote will be stronger Western Sydney than it will in Townsville, in the outer suburbs of Townsville. Mm. I'm sure because I think everyone there's had a good look of what Clive Palmer's competency is like um, with the nickel refinery and. Um, that still leaves a sour taste in everyone's mouth. Um, and um, I don't really want to know what's happened there and that's his business, but it's, it still has left a bad taste in everyone's mouth and it still remains closed. And there was a lot of promises um, made and, and, and suggestions made about it opening back up, and, but it's still closed. And um, we, had, um, we had a position of 10% ethanol mandate and that's been one of our key policies for forever. I've, seen books on ethanol in my house for dad research books since I was a kid. Wow. So I've lived and breathed um, wow. that as a policy. And that's a lot of canvassing and, um, and discussions and research over the years. And 10% probably is, you know, and, and uh, Clive had a um, policy of 20% ethanol, which, uh, I mean, I don't know where that even comes from, but not even the industry itself would support it. The ethanol industry itself would support a twenty percent mandate, so right. it would suggest to me that there's perhaps not as much thought goes into these policies as people might think. Mm. Uh, okay, now if the Catter Australia Party uh, got some kind of um, balance of power or, or mm. influence in yep. the um, next federal parliament, mm. uh, what kind of policy differences would you uh, fight for? Not just support, but mm. what would you, what hills would you die on, with regards to the COVID policies that the federal parliament has has? What would you like to change? Oh well, you know, the one for us is the mandates. Um, How yeah. would you change that from a federal government? If, um, if you got that influence. Well, I couldn't be too prescriptive, but um, that would be a that would be a very strong position that we'd be having that. It, they give consideration to the mandates that they're something we hate. They go against the grain of our um, of our intrinsic sort of values of the party. Mm -hmm. um, so um, you know, one of the one of the tenets of supporting your party was fun and freedoms was trying to um, remove a lot of those um, social regulations. Um, it's it sort of sounds a little bit. Um, contradictory because we probably want more regulations than industry where we um, feel the national interest needs to be protected. Yep. So we're economic nationalists, but on the social side of things, um, you know, access to national parks or, um, um, you know, freedoms around hunting, fishing, camping, um, those sort of things, it's it's pulling away the uh, regulations in that. And, and that fits strongly in that mandate. I mean, so you've always been a strong pro-freedom party? Yeah, we've always um, felt that's one of those central tenets to um, yep. where we are. So that can get a little bit um, distorted, that um, that analysis when it comes to economic um, freedoms, because that's only often strongly associated with like pure free market theories, and and which is something that um, we fight against in many in, in many ways. But um, yeah, so that's that's probably the one area that we're, we're very rock solid on and, and um, it gets us pretty wound up and um, that usually eventuates in becoming non-negotiables when we're... Um, so talking. another key 
election issue. I, I think this year is going to be religious freedom. The government's religious discrimination bill yep. is three times a failure. Mm. Um, the undefinition of marriage in 2017 came with a whole lot of possibilities for building in protections. Um, none of those amendments were supported by the coalition. Yep. Um, what is your position on religious freedom as a policy and uh, what kind of opportunities do you think have been missed and and do you think should be fought for to protect the rights of a Christian school, for example, yep. to require people to adhere to their beliefs to be part of their community? Yep. Um, it's probably easiest to just explain the context of that recent example. There was a Christian school on the north side of Brisbane. Yep. Where, um, City Point Christian College? Yeah. In it was Carindale. just remarkable, like... Um, the, so presumably they've, and one of the stories I heard was, you know, you have a, say a sports policy or, you know, and, and I mean, this is where, this is where people are getting messed up now is when they start turning these gender stuff into the sports because <laughs> yep. they don't have answers there. It's just ridiculous nonsense of the stuff that um, So for example, now. biological males going into the girls' locker room. Mike Tyson becoming a women's world champion heavyweight yeah. um, <laughs> boxing. Like it's... Um, it's just absolute nonsense. If that's what he feels. Yeah, exactly. And, and <laughs> this day of the week, or is it next week, is back to male. So um, just the, the possibilities there are just n nonsense. And, and there could be no logical uh, answer to that. Uh, but in schools, in an attempt, forget their Christian beliefs, anything, in an attempt to try and accommodate this, have said, crikey, we don't know what to do here. <laughs> this is, and if you follow that through logically, look, let's just try and exclude that and that can be a problem for someone else so that we can manage this situation properly. And that becomes this furor and, you know, a, um, you know, a lightning rod for he's a bigot and hate speech and the whole state's turning and media included. And you think, for goodness sakes, it's... So to provide protections like, for blokes like that uh, is absolutely essential. And, mm -hmm. um, and you know, no, ever, I mean, the obvious example is the Israel Folau, um issue, but... Yeah, unfortunately, I, I appreciate it's hard for them, but they just fell so help, hopelessly short on that. And I'm not surprised because there's just, there's that growing margin of um, people who don't see value, you know, aren't willing to be brave on those um, value issues or and even the perception of them. And mm -hmm. so um, something, you know, yes, like I, th I, th I think we've demonstrated enough here in the state Queensland Parliament how far we're willing to go with um, our positions on things and and calling it early on everything that yeah. comes into the state Queensland state parliament so any influence we get in the federal um, naturally translate into that area as well being prescriptive on that I'm not I'm a bit skinny on it um, being focused mainly on the state of I've, I've just been observing that from a distance yeah mm. Australia's uh, Australia's compulsory preferential voting system, mm. uh, lower house and upper house. What are its strengths and weaknesses in your mind and what would you change? Um, I, well, I think most of my friends that don't think too much about politics say it's rubbish. You know, how can, if that bloke didn't get the most amount of votes, how can they win? And, um, and I often say, well, what if there's two people you really don't like and insist cannot be the state member for that area and then one person you really like, and it's not compul it's not preferential voting, and you just vote for them, and then the, the two others get in. Um, when there was a guy over here that you would have preferred next, but this these two got in because your vote exhausted, and wouldn't you have liked to have had the opportunity for your vote to still have some value once that fellow dropped out and get this guy help get this guy, you know? Oh yeah. Well, then maybe it's not so bad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, oh, I see the value in it. And of course, being a minor party, we wouldn't have picked up our third state seat without it. Um, yes, it's it. as it turns out, it's probably enabled the Greens um, to allow. But if you put yourself in my position, I'm someone that's wanted to make a difference. And definitely didn't want to enter politics. I wanted to get involved in a party and try and empower it to change policy. But I had an opportunity to win a seat, so I took it. And, and um, I was confident I could do that. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll put my hand up. I'll run one term and hopefully be able to pad it off to something else. But here I am <laughs> um, three or four terms later. But I've, 
if if you're looking to change policy, am I going to do it through Liberal or Labor? No, I, I'm I'm not that influential, or <laughs> mm. I can, I'm not going to go in there and start making them all agree with religious. Um, uh, you know, the uh, my values or that's just nonsense. And yep. I can um, so you form a new party, and my only way to beat their campaign funds and these massive bloody war chests that they bring to every election, it's you're taking on Coke and Pepsi yeah. and you're Rob Catacola. Um, <laughs> I'll take any hand I can get. And if preferential voting hates, helps me, I'll take the good with the bad. There, there's, if it wasn't um, beneficial for you, do you, do you think it works? I still think so. Because go back to that scenario, if there's, you know, if I've got four there, I'm not in love with any of them, I, I would want that guy. And this lady over here, I think she'd be my next. And this guy just drops out and end of the story. And, and yep. I'd hate to say it, but I'm finding myself in the minority a lot of these time, these days, or I s- seem to be on a lot of these <laughs> issues. That, uh, that's what um, the media lets you think anyway. Well, they, they do, but even, um, yeah, look, by virtue of the place where I live up in the far north, um, you know, obviously there's going to be a divergence of views for around the state. Sure. Um, and so what would you change? Um, what do you think needs a little tweaking and well, improving in well, the system? I, I, think I, I think a lot about this, and I arrived at this answer probably five or six years ago, and I've never budged from it. And it's a really interesting question because one of the things that, um, one of the things that pulled me into politics was challenging free market um, economics and how it's applied to particularly North Queensland which has basically just meant we've gone backwards. But, um, and you go to challenge that, so it's about competition and breeding competition, which on the surface is a, is a, is a virtuous. Um, we should in, um, appreciate competition and you know, make people work harder and, and, and recognise their success of their efforts. And they're all good virtues, but um, the only place where all modern politicians who all subscribe to competition is king and market is king in economic policy, they seem to forget about that when it comes to the parliament because they don't like competition in the parliament. It's true. And you look at it, I'll bring up any of the debates, hands half from debates, like when they were talking about election funding, well, you know, it's nice having these minor parties, but they don't really ever do anything, do they? They don't have any minor parties, just us up here. Oh, so you don't believe in competition in the party. And, um, and I'll, I'll try not to drag it out, but one of the best examples I think I give competition in the parliament is, is ethanol mandate, um, so you're trying to introduce um, and biofuels, it's, which it's hard to say what the, the major driver, whether it's around fuel security or stimulating agricultural industries, diversifying the markets, um, prices pay to the tax of produ- production for um, pet- petrol um, in Australia, but probably fuel security and health, so the emissions are reduced if with biofuels with ethanol in your tank. So, and um, um, anyway, there's ethanol's a big thing for us, big policy idea, cost the taxpayer nothing. It's just so coming back to the voting system. Yeah, so there's, there's a good story here because the LNP put an ethanol bill in twice mm. when they were in opposition, as if to say, you've got to get rid of Labor, so you get us, elect us, and, and this is all about winning seats in cane farming areas. Uh, LNP get elected um, in 2012, and when I first came in, and the ethanol industry came to us and said, well, they're not doing it, then I'm leaving on ethanol. Well, you guys put a bill in. We said, well, we don't have any resources. We'll photocopy the bill from 2010. We put that in. Labor and Liberal both vote against and speak, LNP spoke against its own bill in the parliament, a photoco- literally a photocopy of it. <laughs> we, back, we get back into a hung parliament when Labor's trying to play kiss and cuddle with us because um, we refuse to give them confidence and supply. So they're saying, oh, well, well, we'll do, you know, let's do stuff and we'll do an ethanol bill. And there was going to be two percent. We said, "Get stuffed!" But we'll vote against it. And then became we wanted five percent. Began up four percent. KP's got the ownership of that um, of that amendment in Parliament. Got it through Parliament. Yay! Everyone voted for it. Everyone owned its success. The LNP were heralding their success in Parliament. It was a competitive Parliament. So if it was decent policy, right. I mean, I couldn't bring in rubbish policy into that Parliament. Yeah. And get it up, but I knew it was a good policy. Like everyone should. So when agree you say this. competitive parliament, you're talking about the, the parliament numbers. not being dominated by one or the other by the major parties. Yeah, and and here's the other added so benefit. So a strong crossbench is is precisely. So it's, it's not exactly a electoral it's, system you'd like to change. It's an electoral outcome 
yes. you'd like to change. Good point. Yeah. That you actually, and I'm with you 100%. Yeah. I think the only way to save Australia from both major parties yeah. in this election is a strong, independent yeah. crossbench and it's of not, right-thinking people. So that could deliver us four mm. Greens in the parliament. And you've got to accept that there's no good, perfect right. solution here. That's democracy, whatever. Yeah. But here's the interesting thing. But that doesn't mean the parliament or the voting system's broken. That means the population. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's yeah. a little bit <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> broken. <laughs> but, and here's the interesting thing. Journalists will often say, uh, yeah, so people will be looking for a strong majority. He said, oh, would you be talking about the strong majority that Anna Bly had that, you know, with that confidence drove one of the worst electoral outcomes in history, mm. which then invoked... Um, Camel Newman to come in with a strong mandate mm. and repealed everything Labor had done. So he spent first 18 months repealing legislation and business out there in Queensland going, oh, okay, this is all changed. We're going back to this good. Good on you, Hamble. Mm. And then he's got thrown out and uh, and we came back in with Labor, but into a hung parliament where they've had to have their hands tied. Yeah. And surprise, surprise, they get voted back in. So stability came yeah. from them being separate, not having a strong majority yeah the time when labor didn't have and i remember one of the labor backbenchers saying to me you know we don't bloody like you buggers but at least you've got at least you've um moderated some of our radical people in our our radical wow. policies going into the parliament which means better for me to get re-elected yeah. um so that's competition at working in the parliament and I agree. And everyone says strong. How often do you hear in election campaigns? Oh, you need. You just want someone with a strong majority. Okay. What? And the other one is longer parliamentary terms. What for? What's their agenda? We told you. We yeah. told everyone this four-year term is nonsense. What is Labor parties in Queensland? Yeah. What do they need four years for? They're having trouble spacing out the bloody parliamentary weeks here at the moment. There's nothing. They're just yeah. in. What I made, they've got no agenda. There's yeah. no plan or... Oh, definitely not so, this government. And it's the opposite to um, yeah. competition. Like, yeah, give us four years, we can sit back and do nothing now. Yeah. Thoughts Popular on shooters, stuff, fishers man. and farmers? You're not really up against them head-to-head -head anywhere, are you? Yeah. Look, I, I don't begrudge anyone being up there. And, the, you know, we compete directly with all these guys. And um, But I don't begrudge. I'd be a, a None hypocrite. of their candidates are in electorates no. where your candidates Double are. Double AA... Is convince them to stay out of Queensland, usually. Who? And, uh, Sporting Shooters Association. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. So they're a big donor to us. And, um, and they've said, look, it's pointless us. It's pointless us trying to start a political party or we need some, we need some punch. Um, we need to even, even if it's just intimidation, like WSWA has never directly asked us for anything, mm. um, really. But they like to be able to talk to the government and, and I guess say, so. well, we're going to talk to KP boys if you're not going to... Oh, okay, no, 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 you're right. Well, you know, so <laughs> I, I guess that's how it works. So. Yeah. You can guess who he's voting for. But it's only one vote, the same as anyone else's. And when counting starts, it's soon obvious that there's a big swing against the government. The people have voted in one of the closest elections in Australia's history.